Hello and welcome to PM Express Personality Profile. And today, folks, in all my media life, I think today is one of the days I'm going to be extremely selfish. Why? Because I've come here to personally educate myself. And I just hope that viewers out there share the same sentiment. You know, one of those things where you were not there. And there were people who were there before you. They lived it, they experienced it, they probably wrote policies about it. And you want to find out what happened then, what is happening now. Folks, I won't even keep you in suspense. James Victor Gbeho. Now, this chap was born in tw on the 12th of January 1935 in Keita. Uh, he's a diplomat who has been president of the ECOWAS community of West African State Commission since 2010 till last year, March, uh, to which position he was unanimously elected at the 37th summit of uh, the Authority of Heads of State and Governments of the 15 member states. He was Ghana's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs from 1997 to 2001 under President Jerry John Rawlings. And he was the Member of Parliament for the Anglo constituency from January uh, 20, 2001 to January 2005. He was subsequently a Foreign Policy Advisor to the Government of President John Atta Mills. It doesn't end there. Before his retirement as a career diplomat and politician, uh, Victor Beho worked in the Ghana Foreign and Commonwealth Service and he served in the various capacities at Ghana's diplomatic missions abroad. His postings include Ghana missions in China, India, Nigeria, Germany, United Kingdom and Switzerland. Victor Beho was Deputy High Commissioner to the Court of St. James in the UK from 1972 until 1976. Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Ghana to the European Office of the United Nations in Geneva, and that's in 1978-80, with concurrent accreditation to UNIDO in Vienna, Australia, and was Ghana's permanent representative to United Nations in New York from 1980 to 1990. Concurrently accredited, accredited to Cuba, Jamaica and the Trinidad and Tobago in July 1994. And uh, UN Sec the UN Secretary General appointed him a special representative to Somalia in September 1995. Jerry John Rollins as chairman of ECO was appointed Uncle Victor, as I am going to refer to him in this interview, uh, the ECOWAS Special Representative for Liberia. Guys, we're going to go for a break. When I come back, I am talking to Uncle Victor. Hello and welcome back to PM Express and I think now you understand why I said I'm going to be selfish. For a guy who's lived and has so much experience, I want to tap into his wisdom. I want to know how, when and where. Uncle Victor, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Coming on to PM Express and again thank you for inviting us to your house. Thank you very much for asking me to. Uncle Victor, I want to start with the Ghana that you grew up in in Keta, 1935. How was it like? Well, uh, one thing I can uh, tell you is that it's, uh, it, it was nothing like what we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, this was long before independence mm -hmm. came. And uh, this was uh, a time that uh, the uh, British administration mm -hmm. was uh, beginning to have uh, problems in Europe uh, and elsewhere, the beginnings of the uh, Second World War uh, uh, were on the horizon in the sense that the Nazi party in uh, Germany mm -hmm. uh, was already uh, threatening and uh, all of Europe was uh, 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 rather worried about this development. Well, as you know, late, uh, four years later, the uh, Second World War 
uh, broke out and it had its own ramification on colonies like this one. Uh, supplies were not uh, forthcoming any longer as before and that uh, the fear was so much that uh, the British administration here and uh, people, leaders in this country uh, tried to steady themselves in case the Germans came and struck oh, here. Okay. Okay. And so uh, it wasn't a, a very pleasant time to grow up in. Uh, uh, around 1940, when I began to have uh, consciousness about the, my surroundings, mm -hmm. there was only five then. Okay. The uh, Second World War uh, broke out in 1945. Sure. And uh, uh, broke out in 1939, sorry, mm -hmm. and finished in 1945. 45. So growing up then was uh, difficult. Uh, plus, uh, soon uh, after my birth, three years after my birth, my father moved from Keta to Achimota School. He was uh, invited to join the staff there. So I grew up also on the campus of Achimota School and uh, went to kindergarten there and lower primary before going back to Kita to go to uh, uh, primary school, middle school, and uh, then came back to Achibota school. Let me let viewers also know that uh, Philip Beho, who happens to be Uncle Victor's dad, is the guy who wrote the national anthem. So we are not just in any house, we are in the house. But once we're here today, and Uncle Victor is being around, 25th of May is AU Day. Now this chap here has been in and out of the AU. So if anybody is going to tell us about the relevance of AU as to whether we should still celebrate it, if we should just defragment it and start all over again, carry on as we are, we will find out. Now you see why I'm going to be selfish. I just want to know for myself and I am sure you guys sitting out there in the house also want to know. Now Victor, before I get to uh, AU Day and we'll get to it, the Ghana that you grew up in, if you were born today under the same circumstances, Keta, schooling in Keta, would you have risen up to this rank? Would you have gotten the same opportunity? Well, I'm not sure I would have. Uh, at the time that I was uh, growing up, of course, uh, education was much more limited and therefore uh, the talents were not uh, as many as uh, you have now. Mm -hmm. Now you are educating geniuses in Ghana, which wasn't the same in my time. And then the, secondly also, I think my background uh, prepared me for the kind of uh, work that I chose to do uh, later in life. I said my background because then uh, Africa was not as privileged as it is today, and that uh, Africa was still the dark continent. Africa was just about breaking into uh, the community of nations. There were still prejudices against it. There were many parts that we could not go to, uh, many parts of the world mm -hmm. that were inaccessible to us and uh, and therefore one became uh, a, a militant so to speak mm -hmm. to join in the fight against discrimination against uh, africans and so on uh, apartheid uh, later on came up on the horizon and the terrible stories about it uh, made one feel like going to the field that uh, i went in in order to be able to be part of the solution of the uh, uh, problem. Uncle Victor, today's Ghana, even though liberated and independent, and Ghana when we were being colonized by the British, what is the difference? I mean, I, I don't want to say which is better, but you know, just how was life then and how's life now? Well, uh, colonialism as the world uh, uh, understands it was uh, metropolitan countries from Europe 
finding territories uh, in Africa uh, after 1884 uh, when they shared it amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And it was largely uh, a regime uh, that exploited mm -hmm. uh, the natural resources of Africa to benefit the industries of uh, Europe and elsewhere uh, then. Uh, facilities and resources were limited. There were limited number of schools in this country, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm talking about secondary schools. If you wanted uh, uh, to go to secondary school in those days, in my days, you had only about uh, half a dozen schools to go to. Achimota, St. Agassiz, Addis Adel, Fancy Pim, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, but today you have hundreds, hundreds of it, of thanks it. to uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Yeah. But uh, uh, today it's all changed and people are able to go to many more schools. schools. And uh, therefore uh, the careers that they have chosen uh, today uh, uh, are as diversified as you can find them. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, the reason, there is, there is well, why I limited. ask you that, Uncle Victor, is because we of today's generation seem to think that you guys had it good in terms of education, the quality of it. You look at Legon, in your days it was probably one to a room or maximum two to a room. In our days it's probably 60 or as much as you can pack into a room. And so we look at things that, no, hold on, things were much better then than it is today. Yes, that is quite true. And that is because uh, the uh, colonial administration and the early government of uh, Kwame Nkrumah put a very big emphasis on education, mm -hmm. devoted resources to it, and uh, therefore was able to put as many of us as possible into higher education. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, were not uh, as many as you are today. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, against uh, students is, is the sheer number that government has to look after. You are quite right, uh, we were one to a room mm -hmm. at Legon <laughs> in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, government even paid us allowances to, uh, stay, to, in to stay, stay in school and so on. And none of us paid for uh, tuition, you know. The government uh, provided once you got to Legon, mm -hmm. your education was, was paid for, for, you know, and uh, so it was easier. Similarly, when we finished, uh, jobs were easier to get mm -hmm. uh, because they were available. Uh, Africans <coughs> were beginning to take charge. Krumah's mm -hmm. uh, uh, African personality was beginning to show, and. Uh, since all of us went to university at the cost of government, we were bonded to serve government. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for at least five years. Okay. And so when we were leaving, you were asked to choose two places that you would like to work at. And uh, you normally got one of the two. Life was good. <laughs> that, <that's right>. and, uh, <laughs> you were able to uh, get accommodation easily, uh, or not that difficult. Uh, could we, could we have continued down that road? Perhaps we could have if we had managed our affairs a little better than we did. Uh, and here I'm not talking only about Ghana, I'm talking about the whole of Africa. Africa. Uh, history, the last 50 years, have shown us that uh, perhaps our first uh, string of leaders were not really the capable ones that we thought they were. A lot of them were inexperienced, uh, some were ill-educated, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, tenets of uh, democracy were not clearly defined, and so one by one they turned into dictators and uh, also autocrats and uh, uh, didn't have much use for their cabinets. They made decisions on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these were not necessarily in Ghana, but Ghana was not free of 
abusers. We had also. our we had our fair share. Yeah, that, that's right. We had that, our fair share. Uh, so we slowed it down uh, considerably. Democracy. You touched on democracy, uh, <clears throat> Victor. Do you think that Africa and I use Ghana because I haven't travelled Africa that much. The, the, the Western type of democracy, that English American democracy, did we adopt it too too soon? Should uh, no. we have developed our systems a bit further before we bring that type? Because it, it, it's a democracy that stops you from doing anything. Well, because you then have to go and seek consensus. Mm -hmm. We now have a winner take all because if it's your party, then I don't want you to succeed. So you bring something to come and ask, can I develop this place? And they're thinking, no, if we allow him to develop, he stays in power. So no, don't do it. I mean, did we bring this system in too soon? Should we have developed a bit further? Well, Nana, uh, uh, in terms of the definition that you have given, perhaps uh, well, Africa uh, could have been given a little more time. But uh, from the moment that the Europeans landed on this continent, they stopped the development of our own culture and societies. Mm -hmm. And uh, no matter how long, uh, how longer uh, we would have waited, they were keen on exploitation mm -hmm. and therefore would uh, make sure that we did not interfere with a system largely of law and order mm -hmm. so that they could plunder our, our country. Okay, Victor, with exploitation, mm -hmm. the amount of damage that we are doing today to ourselves, it's nothing compared to what the Europeans did. I mean, if you look at maybe, let's say, Oboise mines and the Pristia mines, they were very well structured, even though they were siphoning everything and taking it away, they were not as damaging as two million people up and down the country, all digging and polluting the waters. Well, the, this is a recent development. Exactly. And it's something that is intolerable, and government and all people must put their, uh, their, their minds and hands together mm -hmm. in order to stop this at once. But I was uh, referring to the question of whether the adoption of, of Western type, exactly, type yeah. government mm -hmm. was good for us. Uh, there was no way we could have continued with African systems because they were uh, uprooted, you know, uh, uh, quite uh, virulently by the advent of Europeans onto this camp. Mm -hmm. They also introduced new religions into mm -hmm. here. So going back to African roots was a, a, a problem. Yeah. My father spent a lot of time touring this country and telling people that uh, there's nothing with your uh, religion, there's nothing wrong with your culture, especially your drumming and dancing, mm -hmm. and that you should practice. It's, uh, it's not a sin. Wow. But uh, wow. prior to that, uh, it was not uh, easy. You know, but uh, having adopted the uh, foreign ideologies mm -hmm. uh, uh, and trying to establish a system of governance that will work here, we have gone through a lot of changes. We probably, per individual, were, were better off under colonial rule mm -hmm. economically. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, I think that if you take the totality of the human experience. Of course, we are better off now than before. We have a lot more civilization. Okay. We have a lot more uh, self-expression, which wasn't uh, there. We have a system that uh, even may be corrupt, but it is still our own system, and we are trying to amend it all the time. And so I, I have a feeling that uh, if we can put our act together, and putting our act together is that we must increase democracy a little more and we must learn not to be as corrupt as we are at the moment. <laughs> 20 that, is, that, that is the problem that I have. 25th of May 1963, the good continent decided that, you know, something, let us all stick together because as the uh, Ghanaian proverb goes that together, you know, there's might. And that if the brooms are all together, it's very difficult 
to break, but one broom would easily snap. And everybody came together. Kwame Nkrumah championed the course. 50 years will be 25th of May, which is just on Saturday. And I, I, looking here, have never seen a continent so divided. You can't even trade with Togo. And they are five minutes away from us. And 50 years down the line, and I am told, and I'm seeing you correct me, that even the EU was sort of formulated against the same ideas that Kwame Nkrumah had for Africa. And indeed, they believe that there are certain paragraphs that even the words have not changed. So they believe they are literally copied and pasted Kwame Nkrumah's idea, changed it to them, and they are going ahead with it. Uh, you have Greece having financial troubles, and they all come together, chipping money to make sure that Greece doesn't fall. Now, I'm going to show you a picture, and I, I don't know if you can see it. Yes. Now, this is the president of uh, Somalia, uh, yes. President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, yes. in number 10 Downing Street. Yes. Now, when he got there, the protocol was a bit lapsed. So instead of them opening the door as he stepped on the mat, the door wasn't opened. So for about 10 seconds, he was just left standing there. All he wanted was 3 million CDs, 3 million pounds in a grant to go to Somalia. And I'm thinking, for Africa, it's just 60,000 pounds per country. Could we not have come together to just help our brother Somalia for a president to be so humiliated in a white man's country for 3 million pounds? And it's 50 years down the line, Uncle well, Victor. Well, uh, perhaps uh, I'll be uncharitable as to say that the uh, then president of Somalia brought it upon himself by not arranging his visit well mm -hmm. because it, should, it never should have, should have happened, happened. Yeah. you know and uh, I don't think that uh, they were reacting to the fact that uh, he no was, the, the, uh, the, the story says it was just a protocol lapse, lapse it yes. wasn't deliberate absolutely but I'm saying that, that just for three million pounds uh, it, it to, was impossible in those days because we were not together no, this, is, this, no, this is this is actually a very uh, recent story. This year, actually, uh -huh, uh -huh. this happened this year. This is okay. two, 2013. Uh -huh. Well, the thinking that is coming up in Africa, in all countries now, is that enough of dependence on outside forces mm -hmm. or what they call uh, foreign direct uh, investments. Mm -hmm. Why can't we put money together? For ourselves. For example, uh, some statistics were released recently. We showed that the amount of money that Ghanaians living abroad were sending back to this country has now exceeded all the monies that Western countries give us in one year. Wow. You know, the Western countries give us, you know, loans and yes, assistance yes. up to about $1 billion a year. But the Ghanaians are now about $1.3 billion. That's the Western uh, Union here, that, money that's grams there. Right. Western, that's okay. right. And not only that, it is felt that it is a more useful uh, income than taking grants from abroad because this is coming through the unofficial system, it is somebody paying for a nephew's education mm -hmm. uh, in Ghana from New York. Mm -hmm. It is somebody sending money to an old aunt to make her able to uh, put a little more money in the farm, the family farm and so on. So it goes directly to uh, uh, benefit communities. Whereas, a lot of the aid that is coming through the official channels now so go into pockets. With sanctions attached. I know. And uh, so uh, the country is not developing as much as it should, taking into consideration the kind of foreign aid that is coming in. You know. So in that uh, uh, respect, people are right in now saying that let's do things for ourselves. You know. Let's cut loose. Because what you, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, strings attached to the monies that you get, uh, make it impossible for you to succeed.
Since uh, about 40 years ago, the uh, World Bank and the IMF have always come with their own uh, 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 solutions to us. You do this before you get our money mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. We have tried, uh, and every 20 years they come back to say that, well, now on hindsight, I, I, uh, we think that we were not quite right in asking you to do structural uh, adjustment and, and so on. Mm -hmm. We must learn to rely on ourselves now. We are of age. In this country, you know, we are 60 years uh, old uh, uh, now, and we should rely on ourselves. We have the people. The only thing is that because of the tangential uh, 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 profits associated with award of contracts and so on, charged to monies received from outside, we are unable to win ourselves from them. Victor, hold on right there because we're coming back. Uh, when I come back, I want to find out if we have AU, then why did we form ECOWAS? And indeed, is it not a conflict of interest to have ECOWAS and then have AU? Are they fighting against each other or do they have a common cause? And how could they have a common cause? Stay tuned, we're coming straight back. Hello viewers, welcome back and just before we went to the break, I want to find out the uh, idea behind ECOWAS and AU. If indeed we have AU, why then do we form ECOWAS? And Uncle Victor has got the answer, I know it. Uncle Victor, the reason why I'm asking that is, if let's say Liberia was in trouble or Togo was in trouble, who then comes to the aid, ECOWAS or AU? Because Let's stick together as an African community. Now let's stick together as West African communities. So I was thinking, is there a conflict? W would there be a conflict? Well, let me go back uh, uh, to how the two organizations started. Sure. And to tell you that both of them were compromised uh, institutions. In the sense that uh, in the 60s, or soon after Ghana became independent, and when Kwame Nkrumah went aggressively on a foreign policy to unite uh, Africa and form a, a, a one single government for the whole of Africa to be able to compete in the international community. There were many, uh, 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 many people, many leaders on the continent who didn't like that, led by Senegal and uh, Cote d'Ivoire at the time. And you know that uh, Africa uh, was split into the uh, Casablanca group and the Monrovia group. Mm -hmm. The Casablanca group, which uh, was led by Nkrumah and others, were more socialist oriented mm -hmm. and they wanted very much a, a government for Africa with its own assets and so on, its own military to defend its interests. And, and uh, of course, the rest, most of whom were under the tutelage of France opposed it and said that Africa's development will be by a, a economic uh, uh, pro progression and so on. And so uh, the argument continued. Kwame Nkrumah was very strong and was succeeding and uh, the other side felt that the best thing to do is to rather st start uh, an institution or an organization in which they will also be part of the decision-making process. Hence came the suggestion of an organization of Afri African unity to which all will belong and uh, decisions taken by consensus. This was the beginning of the AU. Mm -hmm. Similarly, about uh, 12 years later, the uh, countries of West Africa, led principally by Nigeria and Togo at the time, also argued very strongly for uh, a, a sub-regional group uh, which will restrict itself totally to economic uh, and uh, stop thinking about all those things that were coming from Ghana and other uh, they just want uh, economic, progressive They just countries. want economic unity. That's right. Okay. You know, and uh, again, uh, uh, ECOWAS 
the economic community of West African states was formed. Well, both of them had weaknesses. Number one, it was a fallacy thinking that you could uh, develop economically with, with, without uh, a viable uh, political framework, mm -hmm. you know. Especially in West Africa, we found out uh, that. Secondly, the, uh, 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 the, 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 those who argue very much for the founding of this organization and stipulating that Africa's future lay in the laying of economic blocks until development was achieved, have been proven wrong by history. You know, the, uh, both AU and ECOWAS did not start delivering until politics was introduced into them once again. And so uh, the, 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 the moral of the story is that there is nothing called pure economic development. It has to happen within a certain political framework. And what I'm saying by that is that you cannot have development by itself. It must be people oriented. Okay. You must have policies that will improve the lives of people and people live in states, you know, mm -hmm. and that they must integrate. The, one of the African uh, 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 dreams from time immemorial, from the time that Africa was subjected to all sorts of discrimination and so on, whether it was in the West Indies or on the continent of Africa, the African has always cherished the idea of coming together again. We all came from the continent. It was by sad history that we were divided and that uh, you know his history should bring us back. And so integration has always been part of the agenda. But again, in both organizations, we have uh, organized integration rather poorly. I'm not saying that nothing has been achieved. Yes, something has, has been achieved, hence the success of AU meetings and the ECOWAS meetings today. But it has been difficult coming uh, to this stage in the sense that uh, preparations were not uh, very good and Africa has been led uh, kicking and screaming into the development that we have today. Hey, I'll, go, I'll go to AU and then I can probably come back to ECOWAS. Uh, very recently Mali got into trouble few bad guys in Mali decides, you know, we're going to kick off. And Mali is screaming for help, screaming for help, screaming for help. So France then brings troops. France brings troops and realizes, oh no, I need reinforcement. So I could do with, you know, a few African countries to come and help. Well, all the 52 countries, nobody's got an aeroplane to carry their troops. So the English say, oh, no problem. I'll lend you an aeroplane. So the English then brings a plane to come and bring troops to go and help Mali. 25th of May, should we just cancel that day out? If all of us could not even rally together to just go and help Mali, and it wasn't like an all-out war with nuclear bombs or anything, it was just a, an insurgency. If Africa could not save Mali, and it took the French, and it took the English, I sometimes feel a bit embarrassed that come 25th of May, it's going to be a holiday. And then because it fell on the Saturday, we will strike out the Monday. Don't even go to work. Let us all sit there and dream that, yes, indeed, we are united. Because we are not. Yes, I think uh, I agree with you to a certain extent in the sense that we must use that day to think seriously about the African condition on its own continent, to realize that we have not made as much progress as we should have, and that there, was, that there is room for improvement. That integration is the way to go, you know, and not just to uh, buy alcohol, drink that day, and booze, and, and, and leave it there. But how to improve on this? We have been slowed down, uh, or we have been pre prevented from developing by a number of unfortunate things, bad governance, bad leadership, uh, military intervention, and so on. Hopefully, those are things of the past now. Mm -hmm. But even the existing governments are not paying enough attention to their people, the welfare of their people. And that should be the next uh, yes. agenda we should uh, 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 attack. 
And how do you do this? It is through integration. And integration so far has been an integration of states, of governments, instead of an integration of people. Mm -hmm. Integration will come only when young people of, say, Ghana are able to relate very closely with the young people in other West African countries. What is wrong with, during the long vacation, the students from here would spend it with their counterparts in Senegal, for example, and, uh, you know, have cultural exchanges and, and so yeah. on. Yeah. Then they grow up knowing each other. Now, it is about time that both the uh, ECOWAS and AU insisted that all countries to teach more than their official languages in their countries. In Ghana, for example, from the elementary school, the, the, or even kindergarten, the study of French should become compulsory so that each child grows up speaking both English, English and French. French. It is when you understand the person's language that you can relate to that person. And it should be replicated in other countries. That we should do things together. There is no other part of Africa as exploited as uh, West Africa during the exploitatory, mm -hmm. uh, exploitation period. For example, we are divided into 16 different countries. Okay. A lot of it non-viable. It is only when we integrate that they also can. Uh, and why do we want them to uh, uh, also develop or progress? Unless they do so, ours will be meaningless wow. because you have poverty at your doorstep all, all the time. Victor, I'm going straight to North Africa and I'm stopping at Libya. Did, did we have to sit down and let Gaddafi be killed like, a, like an animal? Every leader, I believe, had the, have their faults. And he wasn't without fault. But I think, as far as leadership goes, he played his part. And for all his fault, maybe he deserved a proper trial or, or, or something, you know, uh, a truce, I don't know. But, but, but we sat down. We not, I didn't see any African country that even kicked against it that, no, this is not right. But we just sat down and watched it. Uh, uh, the fate of Gaddafi was unfortunate. Yes, a lot of it was brought uh, upon himself by his policies and his internal uh, governance system. But then, after having shown so much concern for the welfare of the rest of Africa, and uh, at the time that uh, uh, Gaddafi was overthrown and, and killed, he had investment in more than 50 African countries. People here will remember the farms and so on, the hotels and so on that Gaddafi invested in. And he made sure he did. Even when his own people were protesting that he was using too much money uh, on African countries, you know, he was very instrumental in shaping the foreign policy of the continent generally. Mm -hmm. Albeit, uh, uh, support for him was divided. But personally, I agree with you that leadership at the critical time on the African continent failed. We didn't raise a finger to, uh, 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 to save him. Uh, maybe not save his government, but to save the lives of people. If we had as much as told those who were behind yeah, the revolution, so to speak, in, uh, in uh, uh, Libya at the time, that the rest of Africa will not accept the killing of Gaddafi. They would have been more careful. But we, we, we just kept quiet. A lot of other leaders were also so compromised with mm -hmm. the uh, system in Europe and so mm -hmm. on that they felt it was better to keep, keep quiet, quiet than to do anything. Now, we have to learn to protect our vital interests as Africans and as individual 
countries also our national interests. Unless we learn doing that, we will never make uh, progress. We have uh, uh, our brother Mugabe. Now, even though sometimes maybe I don't agree with the way in which he goes by doing something, I think the idea behind it sometimes is fair because if I, or if you lived in a beautiful house and then all of a sudden you come and there were some aliens here and they wanted the master bedroom, they wanted the front room and you are now confined to the storeroom, I'm sure it gets to your point where your lovely grandchildren say, look, grandfather really struggled for this house and if anybody is to sleep in the master bedroom, it should be me. And I'm not going to sack you from the house, but at least you come and stay in the storeroom. I don't believe maybe you have to kill them or beat them, but I think you, you're fair in demanding that, you know, you, th th this is ours and we need a better share of the cake. But again, you don't see African leaders saying that we agree with you, but maybe use a gentler policy or more diplomatic policies. Probably maybe that's why he's just gone wild and say, you know what, I don't care about anybody. Get off my land. I don't know. Maybe you, you are next. Yes, uh, again, you are quite right in feeling, as most Africans do, mm. about the situation in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, one should say that uh, uh, after leading Africa on the path of democracy, and it was in Harare that we adopted the principles of democracy okay. for our continent, you know. And uh, uh, till today, they are known as the Harare principles. And so in that respect, he also has gone overboard some bit, particularly when it deals with the violation of the rights of his own people. Yeah. That is unacceptable. But other than that, you are right. This is a country belonging to them, you know. That this is a country that is sovereign. It has its own rights, you know. And uh, that he stays in office more than two terms is for the people of Zimbabwe to determine, and not from outside. Mm -hmm. We have seen Western leaders stay in uh, 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 power for well, more than well, ten years. A long time. Margaret Thatcher gotcha. did, and others, you know. And yet they want to put uh, us in straight jacket as far as that is concerned. It is compulsory. Take two terms or four years and get out and so on. I would like to see uh, a softening, uh, a bit of that hard line. And also that uh, people like uh, 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 Bogabe will not be harassed to a point that they have to react in the manner that he has. You can tell from a close study of the situation, in the, uh, Mugabe has gone the way that he because he felt that everybody was gunning for him. Mm -hmm. And like the soldier that he was, that he should stand up and face his enemies. That again is wrong. Mm -hmm. There is a better way of running countries and interstate relations. Uh, now, uh, some form of uh, opposition has come to uh, the Zimbabwe again, and we all hope that things will improve. You know, in any case, uh, at his age, he's not going to live forever. The, the, the uh, Zimbabweans should be thinking now about the post Mugabe days. Uncle Victor, let's come to Ghana, and I always argue that we have built a system that will make even the Pope bad. Whereas, you know, you have four years to rule. You, at best, six months to campaign and six months to form a government. So literally, you have three years to rule. Now, you're gonna go back to the ballot box in four years. We haven't educated ourselves. The education system is not the best of its kind. So you can't even tell your electorates that I put policies in place that will mature in 30 years, so vote for me. So you are limited to street lights, boreholes, library, six classroom blocks, KVIP. So you can show your electorates that, look, I did that road and I built that street light, so vote for me. And that is not leadership, that is management. So we, we, we've, we've locked ourselves in a system 
that even leaders will become managers. And I, I don't know if I'm right or if you prove me wrong. Or, no, but, it's a valid uh, point of view. And again, the uh, history behind it, it is that uh, when we became independent, the first uh, uh, string of uh, leaders did not want to leave. Mm -hmm. They overstayed over 20 years and, and so on. In a, uh, uh, in a time span in which they grew more corrupt, more autocratic, and uh, uh, the only organized uh, group in their countries that could effect change uh, uh, was the military. Mm -hmm. Hence the advent of military government. Mm -hmm. in the, the, So there is uh, an argument for rotation. Okay. But perhaps there's something wrong in insisting on the rigidity that uh, Western Europe has handed over to us there now, that if a man stays more than eight years, then he's committing a crime. Then you have a right to, you know, we probably will have to revisit that and let people in countries uh, decide. You know, there are several ways of correcting this. You can still have two terms, but five years instead of the present four mm -hmm. years. That gives a decade to do. It's easier than that, uh, than what we are practicing now. And there are other uh, ways of looking at it, but constitutions must be flexible enough to be able to change when there is a uh, 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 need for a change. But it was in reaction to the overstay mm -hmm of the first run of leaders yes. that we all jumped on this wagon of uh, 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 leaders. Years, I yes, think. you know, I remember when I was foreign minister and as we approached the 2000 election, the uh, a British deputy foreign minister arrived in this country and even before he came to the foreign uh, office or to the castle, was on local FM station uh, saying that uh, President Rawlings uh, should uh, leave now and should. Later on, I invited him and I asked him, before you came here, did you ever hear President Rawlings say at a public meeting that he was not going to go or that he was not going to hold election? He said, no, not really, but uh, the fact is that he must go. I said, says who? says who? You are now thinking for us. I'm not saying that uh, it's wrong to hold elections, but I am against your coming here and trying to whip up uh, 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 sentiments against the leader uh, with a certain a section of the uh, 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 population. Well, I'm sure he will always remember that. But uh, this is how things uh, we are too easily manipulated by others mm -hmm. extraneous to our, uh, our state. Now, since we are talking Africa, Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance, Pan-Africanism is lost because we've all now become westernized, and especially Ghana, because I think Nigeria still hang on to their culture. We are very quick to let go of our culture in our name, our attire, our culture, our food, even our eating is now changing to become more spaghettis and more, it's more westernized. So our pan-Africanism we've lost. The Renaissance has definitely come back because this is where the economic power is. We are definitely growing more than everywhere else. You know, the recession has come in and we're still growing. However, to the detriment of us and not to our benefits, the telecom companies, the mines, the oil guys, they are all foreigners. So indeed the growth is coming, but again, 50 years down the line, Uncle Victor, we're going to miss the boat again. Yeah, unless we do a, a quick uh, change of the dance steps, and that is absolutely necessary. As I said uh, earlier on, no government is any longer good to Africa unless that government will do everything in the name of the development of its people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to borrow money, make sure that the money that you're borrowing will go directly into improving 
the lives of uh, your people and not improving the lives of contractors and their uh, 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 their cohorts, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, also that from now on, that we will uh, dis decide that uh, enough of plundering our, our countries by ourselves, uh, you know, uh, 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 should be declared a state agenda, you know. Every country in Africa, you know, not only Ghana and Nigeria, but all because it's in every country now. And this again is a reaction to the poverty that came on the continent. And so everybody is trying to stack something away so that he and his uh, family will not suffer. Mm -hmm. But if you consider the amount of money that goes to waste as a result of uh, corruption in this country every year, we can progress you know, uh, with that money. But, you know, we are not uh, doing so. And, uh, but I have the feeling that we are approaching a turning point now, when corruption will become just simply uh, ridiculous, you know. And everybody says, no, we must, we must change now. And I was listening to a radio program this morning, and they were talking about the textile industries. Mm -hmm. How, you know, companies outside this country are copying uh, 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 designs and prints, dye prints and so on, and then smuggling it back, back into in this country, country for a cheaper amount and so on. Well, this is where our Ministry of Trade and others will have to do some thinking. The only way to fight smuggling anywhere in the world is to make it no longer worthwhile for the one who is risking his life uh, uh, to smuggle, you know. Uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, 40 years ago, overtook Ghana as the biggest uh, uh, producer of cocoa. cocoa. Not because they had the cocoa, but a lot of Ghana's cocoa we was being smuggled into the, the, that place. Since we also learned to pay farmers more for their cocoa, that uh, smuggling has virtually stopped. Stop. If anything, it's Ivorian farmers who are trying hard to bring their yeah, cocoa to yeah. that so that they can get a little more money. And so we must do that. We must come together with our neighbors, you know, discuss these things very seriously. And here, even though I, I am uh, the immediate past president of the ECOWAS Commission, I believe that ECOWAS will probably have a better future if we start, uh, start in little groups. Ghana and a few others must take this free movement seriously and implement it and let others join can, later can we, with, on, like the European Union did. Can, can we start like ECOWAS? Can you start like, let's say, or an ECOWAS cocoa board where all cocoa is bought by just this ECOWAS cocoa board? Just one commodity. We all bring our cocoa to this place, get our money, and then the Europeans have to come to this market and then buy it. So that Ghana doesn't export direct, you don't export direct, we all bring it here so we can at least control it. And then probably if it works, we take it to mangoes. If it works, we take it to furniture. Would it work or am I, is it? it is, you are quite right and it is possible to do that. Uh, we don't have to have one single uh, place where you take it but we can have one single organization, you know, just as we, we had the International Cocoa Agreement mm -hmm. under the UN auspices some time ago. Uh, you know. uh, our time is running up, but one question that I wanted to ask you is most of the countries that you have worked in, India, Switzerland, UK, <clears throat> these were all countries who gave us money you know, in terms of donor countries. And you look at the lifestyle that we live here, i.e. the top hierarchy, it is more affluent than these countries that give us money. You being a diplomat, you know, strolling their corridors, because unfortunately you are the one, you are the face there. Was there that sentiment of these guys are living too large or they don't say it in front of you and they'll say it behind you? Did you hear whisperings like that? They did. They did. They did. When we started buying big Mercedes cars here in this country. 
you could count the number of Mercedes on the streets of London because it was too expensive. Yeah. You know, the, the, there was a tax disincentive, you know, for buying. The cars, uh, yeah. But since they were doing good business with us, since they were convincing uh, African governments through corrupt individuals to, to sign contracts that were not in the interest of uh, African people. countries, but their own people. This is how they kept quiet and watch us do the ridiculous till today. Yeah, behind every corrupt politician in uh, this part of uh, Africa is uh, 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 Western uh, uh, a Western uh, power or agent or company and so on. They introduced us to these things and, and they find it difficult to stop now because we have almost obtained uh, a, a doctorate degree <laughs> in this thing, you know. Uh, but just, we need to change. Okay, just to round up, uh, AU Day is the 25th of May, just round the corner, probably just a couple of days. Uh, just a message for the youth. What do we do? What, what's the new Africa for us? Well, I think to the youth of Africa today, I will thank them first for the cooperation that they have uh, extended to individual governments to bring us as far as we have. But there must also at the same time be a realization that the African agenda is unfinished, that we need to do more things in the area of Pan-Africanism, in the area of even decolonization. We have succeeded in decolonizing most parts of the country, but there is still Western Sahara we must, uh, the, uh, part of the unfinished uh, agenda is to be able to trade amongst ourselves, to uh, educate ourselves, uh, not only in the subjects that are of uh, interest to Western countries, but of ourselves also. And uh, the next 50 years should be a defining moment. Every country, every institution, finds it difficult at the beginning. We have learned our lessons. Half a century is enough to learn those lessons. Let us resolve, all of us, to do things better than now. And that is the agenda of the youth who should keep pressure on their governments. <coughs> Viewers, thank you so much, Uncle Victor. Thank you. Uncle Victor. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> a living legend. And I told you that I was coming here on a selfish mission. I just wanted to know all these things for myself. And I was just hoping that you at home had the same idea and the same questions running your mind. And he's answered all these questions. Thank you very much for watching uh, PM Express Personality Profile. We'll back with you on Monday to start all over again. Thank you. <laughs>